In this program, we're going to take a look at the factors that affect the rate of a reaction. And when explaining those factors, they go back to a thorough understanding of collision theory. And this is something you need to commit to memory. Um, the idea that in order for a substance to react, first, they must collide. And second, that collision must have sufficient energy. We call it the activation energy and be with the appropriate geometry. So let's start by taking a look at what effect concentration has on the rate of a reaction. So here I have an example of something which has a low concentration of reactants and here a high concentration. The first thing you'll notice that is in a high concentration, the distance between the particles is less. That leads to more frequent collisions and meets the first criteria of our collision theory. So if our concentration increases, we end up with a situation with more frequent collisions. Now we'll take a look at pressure, and pressure affects gases only. Let's uh, make a copy of this situation and bring it over here. If I apply pressure, I squeeze the sides of my container in. That also leads to a reduction of the distance that our particles need to travel to collide. So I also have more frequent collisions. So if my pressure goes up, so does my rate. Now let's take a look at the effect of temperature. To understand temperature, I'm going to explain it using the Maxwell-Boltzmann energy distribution diagram that I've labeled here. But before I get to that diagram, let's use an analogy. Let's look at a test score distribution. So you had a test on some topic in IB chemistry, and I have a distribution down here, a scale of scores, 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 50, Forty to 60, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100. In my initial distribution, I have a certain number of students that score rather poorly, a little bit more that do better, and then we start to get into a, a passing number up to 60%, um, and a large number that perhaps fall in this range, and a few in this range. This is what we call a distribution. And on the side, I have my number of students that scored in those particular ranges. In a Maxwell-Boltzmann energy distribution, it's not scores we have, but the kinetic energy of the particles. And on this side, we have the number of particles that have that kinetic energy. We don't use blocks, but rather draw it as sort of a smooth curve. So this would represent the distribution of kinetic energies that my particles have. Now, let's go back to my analogy for a moment. Let's say students that score 80% or higher, so over in this range, that would be these particles, um, they get Friday off. We can always dream. But um, the same idea applies to a reaction. There's a certain cutoff. We call that cutoff the activation energy. And all the molecules that lie to the right of it, these would be capable of reacting at this particular temperature. I'm going to say this represents 300 Kelvin. Let's say we move to a new temperature. How does this change? To explain that, let's go back to our analogy. Let's say we have an easier test. So now the distribution might look something like this. One of the important features is that the area underneath this must remain the same. My number of students must remain the same. So the distribution tends to shift a little bit to the right, but I have to keep the area 
the same. So that leads to a, a flattening out of the curve. So this would be the distribution at a higher temperature, say 310 Kelvin. What you'll notice is I can now have more students that get Friday off. In the same way over here, these now also exceed the activation energy. So I now have more molecules that are capable of reacting. So temperature has sort of a twofold effect. First of all, because they're moving faster, you get more frequent collisions. But in addition, a greater portion of those collisions exceed the activation energy. So again, temperature goes up, twofold effect, more frequent collisions, and a greater portion of the collisions are successful because they exceed the activation energy. Now let's take a look at what a catalyst does. To start off, let's start off with a reaction that's not catalyzed, and I'm going to present it here on an energy diagram. And we've seen these before. On this side, I'll plot the potential energy of my reaction and on this side, the reaction ordinate. You can think of it as the progress of the reaction. So I start off here with my reactants, and then over the course of time, and there's the reaction moves forward, I finish up with my products over here. And as that reaction occurs, there's a certain hill they must climb in order to react. The height of that hill, we've seen it earlier, is referred to as the activation energy. So that would represent my activation energy, the minimum energy required for a successful collision. A catalyst provides an alternative pathway that has a lower activation energy. And I'll show that with gray. So it comes along like this, has a different path finishing here. And we can see the height of its hill is lower. So that's the activation energy for my catalyzed reaction. That then results in a greater fraction of the molecules being able to react successfully. So introducing a catalyst provides an alternative pathway with a lower activation energy. And again, that lower activation energy provides a more and again, that lower activation energy ensures that a greater fraction of the collisions are successful. Now, one may also be asked to explain how a catalyst works on a Maxwell-Boltzmann energy diagram. So again, let's quickly review that. This axis, again, is the number of particles and this, the kinetic energy. And we are operating it at some temperature that has this distribution. Now I'm gonna mark on this the activation energy. To do that, let's go over here and take this, and which is a measurement of the activation energy. And I'm gonna take that information and put it on this diagram. So that would be the activation energy with no catalyst. And so this fraction of molecules are capable of reacting without the catalyst. Now, let's bring over the activation energy where we have introduced the catalyst. 
it's a lower number. So our activation energy now lies here. This is where the new activation energy is. And as a result, these additional molecules are capable of reacting. So this is the so this is the activation energy with my catalyst marked on it. Finally, let's look at the effect of surface area. And I should mention that this deals with what we call heterogeneous systems only. Heterogeneous systems are ones where we have two visible phases. So they would include things like, say, we have bubbles of a gas going through a liquid that are reacting. Um, we could have a gas reacting with a solid. Um, down below, I'm going to suggest perhaps we have a reaction that takes place at this interface or surface between two emissible liquids. So surface area effects only come in when we're dealing with heterogeneous systems. So here I have a solid cube. Um, and I'm going to say for sake of arguments, it's a two centimeter by a two centimeter uh, by two centimeter cube. Now, the surface area of that cube, I'll say SA, would be two by two, that's the area of one face, and there's six faces altogether. So the surface area here would be 24 centimeters squared. That is the reacting particle that has to collide with the particles of that surface in order to react. If I take the very same mass and now divide the cube, cutting it in half in both planes, I would now end up with eight smaller cubes, each one measuring one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So the surface area in my new situation well, each of those has a surface area of one by one, and there's six faces on each one, but I also have eight cubes. So that now leads to 48 centimeters squared. I've essentially doubled the surface area available for my reactants to collide. So surface area is another factor that affects the frequency of collision. Surface area increases the frequency of collision. So let's apply some of what we've learned in this multiple choice question. Here we're asked to determine which set of conditions would lead to the fastest reaction. Well, from we just covered in surface area, a powder has more surface area. And we also know concentration has an effect. The higher the concentration, the higher the rate. So my answer here would be 